Let's do a quick recap of uh, what are the benefits of running a remote tracking server. So before we just uh, launched the server on AWS, some of the benefits that we can mention is that you can share your experiments with other deep scientists. If you want to build a model, maybe collaborating with other people, you can create an experiment, add some runs, and then maybe a different person can continue exploring hyperparameters or different versions of the model or the data and uh, then collaboratively you will build the machine learning solution. Another benefit is that you can also collaborate with other members of the team to build and deploy the models. As we mentioned before, with this setup, you can use a model registry. And so maybe one or, or more data scientists build the model and then they move the best models to the model registry. And then uh, another member of the team, like an MLE or an SRE, can take these models from the model registry and deploy them to, to production. And then uh, the last benefit is regarding the visibility of the data science effort. So in this case, let's say that there are some stakeholders that are interested on these uh, ML models, or maybe the PM of the team wants to understand the progress with the ML project. And then they can access the tracking server, explore the experiments and runs, and also take a look at the models. Here, I wanted to talk about some issues regarding uh, running a remote tracking server. In this case, we were using a shared instance, so uh, there was a unique MLflow server that uh, every team was using. So yeah, the first issue is related to the security. Of course, you need to restrict the access to the server. The easiest solution would be to set up a VPN, so only people that can connect to this VPN will have access to the server. Otherwise, you know, people from outside your organization may get access to the experiments and the runs and models. This can be, you know, a security issue at some point. When it comes to scalability, if you are thinking about using this server to maybe track, I don't know, hundreds or thousands of experiments, you may want to check these two links. The first one shows you how to deploy MLflow on AWS Fygate. So basically, this is a solution from AWS hosted in, in AWS that can scale nicely when the number of users that access this server increases. And the second uh, link is from uh, Criteo uh, about how they scaled MLflow to be able to support thousands of experiment runs and also of models. And finally, uh, Another issue is related to isolation of these experiments and models. So if you plan to use the remote tracking server and, and share it among different teams, then you can start having issues. For example, the experiments can get messy very quickly because it's uh, possible that maybe different teams decide to use the same name for the experiment. And then the, the runs from the two teams will be included in the same experiment, or maybe they you know override an existing model by adding a new version and stuff like that. So in order to avoid that, you can you know define the standard for naming the experiments, maybe adding the name of the team as a prefix in each experiment, and same thing for the models. And regarding the tags, there is another option, which is to set a default set of tags that everybody has to use. For example, uh, the name of the developer, the name of the team. So in that case, even in the case that teams are using the same names for the experiments, you can easily filter out the runs from other teams. Then another possible problem is uh, access to the artifacts. So you don't want uh, you know other people to mess up with your models. Uh, maybe they, these are production models or you're working on some company has some kind of regulations regarding models. So it's important to, to, to have some kind of control of who can have access to these artifacts. In this case, an easy solution would be to have different S3 buckets that live on, on different accounts, AWS accounts. So when you set up an experiment, you can define a different artifact store for this experiment. And then maybe if these are important models that you want to restrict the access, you can create uh, the experiment by configuring a, a different S3 bucket. And that will have some level of control of who can access the models and artifacts, right? Because only people that has access to this account will be able to list the models and to modify them. Here I include some limitations from MLflow. These are maybe examples in which actually you may want to use something different. The first one is, yes, regarding authentication and users. We have already talked about this. Uh, so the thing is that the open source version of MLflow doesn't provide any sort of authentication. It doesn't have any concept of users 
or teams, then you need to find workarounds to overcome these issues. But actually, if you use the paid version of Databricks, there is an ML platform provided by Databricks that includes MLflow. And in that case, yes, then there are users, you can create users, and also I think that the, the concept of teams is also there. But yes, if you want to use the open source version of MLflow, then it, it won't be possible. The second problem on limitation is uh, regarding data versioning. So if you want to ensure full reproducibility, you need to version your data sets as well as the experiments and runs, right? But the MLflow doesn't provide a built-in solution for that. Although there are, again, some workarounds that you can use for example, you can keep track of the path that takes you to the to the data set. Uh, you can uh, include some maybe hash uh, that you calculated on the files on the data set. If, if the data set is small enough, you can save the data set as an artifact. Although this is, of course, not the optimal solution. Finally, regarding model and data monitoring and alerting, Yes, this is perhaps outside of the scope of MLflow. I showed you that MLflow focuses on experiment tracking and model management, but all things related to monitoring the model in production or maybe monitoring the, the, the distribution of the data or checking for outliers in the data, this is not part of what MLflow focuses on. Uh, but I know that uh, some people use MLflow for this. Uh, maybe they calculate statistics about the models in production and save it to MLflow as an experiment, but I, I don't know, I don't think that this is the best use case for MLflow. I will probably use a different tool. If you are thinking about MLflow alternatives, there are some paid alternatives and open source too. And here I include three paid uh, alternatives uh, that uh, actually, if you are an individual, you can use them for free, but if you are planning to use it in a team, then you, you will need to pay. And they have very, very similar features compared to MLflow, but in some cases they, they have a more suitable features depending on the problem, on the domain, or maybe they offer some extra features that are not included in MLflow, like you can create users, or maybe you can create reports on, on your experiments and runs. And here, actually, I include a link and let's explore it. This is also from the Neptune.ai blog. So yes, this is uh, the, an article on the Neptune.ai blog. And I'd like to show you this table. Um, let me take MLflow here. Okay, so here we have MLflow, the Neptune, weights and biases and comment. And then uh, you can see that it compares these three tools on different aspects. So first, there is an overview. And for example, what is the focus of each tool? In case of MLflow, it's the entire life cycle. For Neptune, the focus is on the metadata storage, experiment tracking, and model registry. And then uh, when it comes to weights and biases, it focuses on experiment management and same thing for a uh, comment. So they don't have, for example, a model registry, which is available in Neptune and MLflow. Regarding the price, MLflow, the open source version is for free. In the case of Neptune, Weights and Biases and Comet is free for individuals. Uh, there is a usage above free quota. And then for teams, it's paid. Then something that is also worth mentioning is MLflow can be included. If you have the Databricks ML platform, then MLflow is included as a managed MLflow tracking server. So in this case, you have some of the features that are lacking in the open source version. And the other three tools are managed closed services. Regarding the tracking features, okay, experiment tracking features. So for example, what are the kind of uh, metadata that you can log and display? And in the case of MLflow, you can see that, for example, for data set, it is limited, which is what we mentioned before. But the same thing applies to the other three tools. You cannot log and maybe have a data versioning or lineage with these four tools. And then when it comes to code versions, so MLflow cannot detect when there is a change in the source code that is not committed. So that's called a dirty commit. So for example, if you are using MLflow and you make a change on the, on the code, right? And you don't commit this change, MLflow will assume that you are still using the same version as the last commit. But this is in the case of Neptune, weights and biases and comment. They are able to detect that the commit is dirty and they will tell you that. So you take that into account because otherwise you won't be able to reproduce the results in, in some cases, right? And then uh, regarding parameters, yes, you can log parameters and metrics with MLflow, but you cannot log images, audio, video, and hardware consumption that is possible to be logged using Neptune. Regarding hardware consumption, this is interesting. 
So it means the usage of CPU and memory during the training. This is possible to keep track using Neptune, weights and biases and Comet, but not in Emanflow. Yes, then the, how you know if it how easy it is to compare experiments or maybe organizing and searching experiments and metadata, you can take a look at this table later. The last thing I wanted to show you is regarding integrations. So here you can see that Emanflow has integration with many packages like Keras, TensorFlow, PyTorch. Yeah, I think that most of the popular uh, data science library or ML library are in integrated to Emanflow. But in the case of Neptune, it has uh, many more integrations, like for example, TensorBoard, okay, Emanflow and Sacred are integrated to Neptune, but not in the case of Emanflow. QFlow also is not integrated to Emanflow or Google Colab but in the case of Neptune, it is integrated. Weight and Biases also has very nice uh, set of frameworks that are integrated, uh, and in the case of Comet, it's a bit more limited. So we have finished the presentation from today, and this is the last video of the experiment tracking module. In this video, we talked about how to use MLflow in practice. I show you different ways in which you can run the MLflow either with a tracking server or without a tracking server. I also show you how to deploy a remote tracking server, which is a very common setup in the case that you want to use MLflow on your company, maybe in your organization. And also we talk about some limitations from MLflow and uh, we compare different alternatives. I hope that you have enjoyed the contents and uh, best of luck during the rest of the course.